वर्ड्स आर ब्रिजेस शब्द सेतु है अल्फाज दिलों को और इंसानियत को जोड़ने का एक अजीम और तरीन पुल है आखिर हमारे मेल सन आखिर हमारे जोड़ी Shabda Setu Hoon. Shabda Disan. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of our festival co-directors Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, festival producer Sonjoy Roy, and all of us at Team Work Arts, I welcome you back for another episode of Jaipur Literature Festival's Words Are Bridges. Words Are Bridges takes you on multilingual journeys, celebrating the richness and diversity of Indian languages through translations. Our session today is Hellfire. Liza Ghazi and Shabnam Nadia in conversation with Mala Shri Lal. Author and screenwriter Liza Ghazi's intriguing novel Hellfire has been rendered into English from the original Bangla by translator Shabnam Nadia. A tale presented in taut prose, it revolves around the caged life of two sisters and introduces us to a carefully constructed web of secrets and deceit. Gazi is also the joint artistic director of a London-based arts company, Komola Collective, and has directed, performed, and co-written critically acclaimed theatre productions. Nadia's work includes the award-winning translated manuscript of Bangladeshi writer Mashiul Alam's story, Milk. In a conversation with Mala Shri Lal, they discuss the joys and challenges of translating Hellfire, and together unravel the heart. of the narrative Lisa Ghazi is a British Bangladeshi writer actor filmmaker and joint artistic director of Kamula Collective Ghazi is the co-writer and performer of the play Biranguna Women of War she recently directed multi award winning documentary Rising Silence that sheds light on the lives of wartime rape survivors Shabnam Nadia is a Bangladeshi writer and translator settled in california a graduate of the iowa writers workshop she was awarded the steinbeck fellowship for her novel in progress the penham translation grant lisa gazi is a british bangladeshi writer actor filmmaker and joint artistic director of komola collective gazi is the co-writer and performer of the play virangona women of war She recently directed multi award winning documentary Rising Silence that sheds light on the lives of wartime rape survivors. Shabnam Nadia is a Bangladeshi writer and translator settled in California. A graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, she was awarded the Steinbeck Fellowship for her novel in progress, the Penheim Translation Grant and the Himal South Asian Short Story Prize for her translation of Bangladeshi writer Mashiul Alam's fiction. Nadia's translations include Lisa Ghazi's Hellfire, Moinul Ehsan Saber's The Mercenary, and Shaheen Akhtar's beloved Rongmola. Mala Shri Lal recently retired from her academic and administrative positions at the University of Delhi's English Department. She is a member of the English Advisory of the Sahitya Academy and Bharatiya Gyanpeet's Advisory Committee. Her specialization is in literature, women and gender studies. Her books include In Search of Sita, Revisiting Mythology, Tagore and the Feminine, A Journey Through Translations and Finding Radha, The Quest for Love. Lal has been a senior consultant to the Ministry of Culture UGC nominee on committees and a member of international book award juries before we move on to our session we request you all to follow us on our handles jlf lit fest on facebook twitter and instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues you can find us on our youtube channel jaipur lit fest jlf or on our facebook page jlf lit fest We now present to you Hellfire Lisa Gassi and Shabnam Nadia in conversation with Mala Shri Lal. Hello everyone. It's indeed a delight to be at the JLF session today and we have here Lisa Gassi 
and Shabnam Nadia, an outstanding novel called Hellfire set in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I have to tell both of you, Lisa and Nadia, that once I started, I couldn't put the book down. It was racy, exciting, scintillating, with very smooth translation. And I'm a Bengali knowing person, so I could intuit the language behind, but it just flowed absolutely beautifully. So congratulations, both of you. So this gripping story of the two sisters, Lovely and Beauty, about 40 years old in a middle-class Bangladeshi family, they are imprisoned in a sense at home by their mother, a most imperious matriarch. And uh, the story moves in a way that the three women are dealing with different kinds of confinement in a way. What, according to Lisa, would you tell us is the impetus for this story? How did it come to you? It's a most unusual and a very uh, driving kind of an energy in that story. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for having us uh, in, in this session. Uh, the impetus actually um, behind Road Rob is, is to feel free, you know, to, to have uh, freedom. Um, it has come from the deep desire for women to have equal rights to freedom in our in our society, in our homes. You know, freedom of expression, uh, movement, association, uh, choice, um, and there is a there is a collective effort in our homes and and society, as as we all know and feel, uh, to cartel the power of imagination of women. You know, to make uh, to make them believe they are not good enough, um, and uh, to keep them within uh, within four walls, uh, to make them feel ashamed, even doubtful for their own aspirations. Uh, when when a woman um, growing up in that environment realizes for the first time what it's actually feel like to feel free, uh, what it's like to take control of our own life, uh, then something, I think then something fundamentally changes from deep within. Uh, something happens uh, to that woman. Um, and that woman can never willingly, to, uh, you know, can go back to a place where she cannot feel free, uh, cannot act free, cannot think free anymore. Uh, uh, that woman will try to do everything in her capacity and power to remain free to, uh, you know, to, to, to be able to feel uh, freely, to act freely. So that's so a very freedom. beautiful, sorry. So that's a very beautiful theme to pick up and very pertinent in today's context in, in uh, South Asia, certainly, but many other parts of the world. But your particularities are such that it locates it in a certain domesticity where uh, the refusal to give women freedom is so very evident. Uh, Nadia, could I ask you what led you to selecting this novel to translate? Um, there have been ecstatic reviews about the book already, though it was only published a month ago in the English translation. And I was looking up the Dhaka's uh, Daily Star which it says that the translation floats like charged air, transparent yet propulsive. Uh, you surely deserve that compliment. Thank you. So, uh, what led you to the selection of this book? There were multiple um, elements that really drew me. I've spoken about a couple of things before, like the op um, kind of... Um, I was really drawn by the voice. I'll say that um, the element of uh, depiction of women's sexuality, which we don't often see this way in Bengali literature. Um, but you mentioned the specificity of the domestic um, milieu that that we get there. It's very Bangladeshi, very middle class urban Dhaka life of a certain time, um, which is essentially when I was coming of age. So um, that's very, very familiar to me. The other thing that I thought of was that um, Women being portrayed in Bengali Bangladeshi fiction, you often do, like it's often that it's not often that you see a certain way of being 
And um, there were two books that struck me in the last five years. One was Row Rub, Hellfire. The other book is by um, a younger writer, Barnali Shaha. She wrote a novel called The North End. And that's again, uh, in a woman's world, a woman's, a very different kind. Um, but both these books to me um, brought out, which I don't really see often, a certain more contemporary younger woman. They're 40, um, Lovely is 40 and Beauty is just a few years younger than her. But um, it's just, I don't know, the way that a woman's world is portrayed is often from the outside. And I felt like this book, it, it's like the inner world that women can inhabit. And then, you know, it's, a, it's an extreme story, of course. It has to be to, you know, create that pacing, create that drama. But that was, I think, one of the key crucial elements that drew me to this book. Well, indeed, I can see that you were very uh, engaged with the act of translation itself. So, uh, Lisa, I'm going to ask you a little more about this metaphor of confinement, because uh, the novel deals with women, yet there is a great deal of violence. You know, it's psychological violence, it's physical spaces which are locked all the time. The mother locks the front gate, double pad locks, then she rock, locks the rooftop. The two sisters are locked into their rooms. So there is this constant imaging of imprisonment, confinement, and control over other people. So is the novel looking towards portraying a larger context of confinement uh, when freedom is removed from people as such, such as in a war or in uh, civil unrest? And I'm particularly thinking of that passage about the crows flying overhead and Farida almost going berserk at that time with a repressed uh, kind of frustration, anger. I don't know how you as an author would look at that passage. Lovely if you could read it and tell us a little about that. So shall I read it first or tell us, I tell you yeah. about it first. Maybe say a little about how you came to write that passage and what do the crows stand for? Uh, you know, I, I was not deliberately done that, uh, but I guess that, you know, when you, um, when you grew up with, with, um, with, with an environment um, that is uh, that is very violent um, and that is very kind of politically uh, a very um, you know uh, I mean it, everywhere it was it was really uncertain unsettled and when you grew up with uh, we uh, I think I, I'm a I'm I'm the first generation right after the liberation war of Bangladesh. And while we were growing up, we, I haven't seen it, but um, uh, you know, when we were growing up, we knew that we, we passed uh, a bloody, brutal war. And then what happened, uh, the founder of the, um, of the nation was assassinated with um, almost entire his family. We, uh, we, we saw uh, two nasty military coups and then almost a decade of dictatorship. And and the rhetor and the rhetorics like uh, you know uh, crossfire and uh, and curfew and uh, you know um, uh, will be shot at as soon as seen in Dakhamatra uh, Guli We we grew up hearing the, this rhetoric, observing this reality. So um, although it was not deliberately done, but I think that you know uh, experiences that we have. Uh, I, of course, it seeps, um, it seeps into the narrative that you are writing. So I'm sure that from, from there, it, 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 is, it is that. And, and these words become part of our vocabulary when we are growing up. Um, uh, and when you think about it, that all kind of freedom were, uh, all kinds of freedom was taken away from us. Um, so this family, um, could be uh, could be seen as an extension of that context, but no, it wasn't deliberately done. But I'm glad that um, uh, it could be interpreted that way. I and it's also it true that the well. domestic. Sorry, I'm just going to add please. that. Um, no, I'm just going to add that. Like, it's also true that when we think of the domestic, we think of you know serene um, environment and and caring and love and all of that. But the domestic milieu can be 
very, very violent. And I think particularly as women, we see that a lot. So that is, was another thing that I found fascinating in this book and that, you know, it's absolutely a domestic setting. Uh, we do see a little bit of the city, but the entire book is kind of inside, as you said, it's a confined space of the mind, if not also in, in addition to being physically confined, their minds are confined in a way. Um, and that violence just, uh, I don't know, like counterbalances what we think of when we think of the domestic, when we think of, oh, women are nonviolent creatures and like all of those things that we take kind of as part of our social um, understanding of the world, most of that is actually not very true. And I think that, mm. that, found, a, that found a space in this book. True. The novel breaks that stereotype of women being nurturing and mothers particularly being nurturing. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it breaks that idea that there's all this gentleness and love and affection which families share. But we know from many sources in literature that families can be the most oppressive unit in society. And there's that famous novel by Lorca, House of Bernarda Alba, which has a similar mother figure uh, controlling five daughters. So um, maybe, Lisa, you could read us that passage about the crows on the rooftop? Yes, I'd love to. Uh, yes. Uh... কাকের ডাকের কর্কশ ধাক্কায় ফরিদার সম্বিত ফিরে এলো আকাশের দিকে তাকিয়ে দেখলেন একটা কাক বেশ নিচু দিয়ে তাদের ছাদটাকে কেন্দ্র করে ঘটছে আর কা কা ডাকছে আশেপাশে আর কোনো কাক দেখা যাচ্ছে না কাকটাকে হাত উঁচু করে হুস হুস শব্দে তাড়াবার চেষ্টা করলেন লাভ হলো না কাকটা বরং আরো মরিয়া হয়ে ফরিদার উপর থেকে বিপজ্জনক দূরত্বে বৃত্তাকারে ঘুরতে শুরু করল আর তারও সরে ডাকছে তো ডাকছেই নির্জন দুপুর আশেপাশের ছাদে একটা প্রাণীও নাই এরকম সময়ে একটা কাক তীব্র কর্কস্বরে কা কা ডেকে চলেছে ঢেউহীন পুকুরের মতো সে নিস্তরঙ্গ দুপুরে কাকের কর্কস্বর মনে হলো অন্য কোনো দুনিয়া থেকে আসছে শুধু ফরিদাকে সাবধান করবার জন্য কাকটাকে তাড়াবার জন্য ফরিদার জি চেপে গেল ছাদের কোনা থেকে একটা ঢিল নিয়ে কাকটার দিকে ছোঁড়ে মারলেন ঢিলটা কাকের আশেপাশেও যেতে পারল না মাঝপথেই মাটিতে মুখ থুপড়ে পড়ল ঢিলটাকে গ্রাহ্যই করল না কাকটা আশেপাশে কোনো কাক মারা যায় নাই তো একবার ভাবলেন ফরিদা না না তাহলে একটা না সাথে আরো কয়েকটা কাক থাকতো মনের ভিতরের কু ডাক আবার প্রবল বিক্রমে ফিরে এলো অনেক উঁচু থেকে দেখলে দৃশ্যটা এরকম দেখাবে একটা নির্জন ছাদ দুপুরের স্তব্ধতা চারদিক থেকে ছাদটাকে চেপে ধরেছে সেই ছাদে ততধিক নির্জন একজন প্রৌঢ়া এলো পাথারে ছুটে বেড়াচ্ছেন আর মাথার উপরে দু হাত ছোঁড়ে অন্ধের মতো হুস হুস করছেন তার ঠিক চোখের তারার উপরে কালো মকমলে মোড়ানো একটা কাক বৃত্তাকারে ঘুরছে আর বিরামহীন কা কা ডেকে চলেছে কিছু একটা ঘটবে ভয়ঙ্কর কিছু একটা ঘটবে কুল ছাপানো নদীর মতো এই অমঙ্গল চিন্তা বারবার ফরিদার মনে আছড়ে পড়ছে আর তখন তার সমস্ত রোষ গিয়ে পড়ছে কাকটার উপর যেন কাকটাকে তাড়াতে পারলেই তার এবং তার পরিবারের উপর থেকে সমস্ত বালামসির পর কেটে যাবে ছাদে পা দিয়ে একটা অদ্ভুত দৃশ্য দেখে বিউটি স্থবির হয়ে গেল সে অবাক হয়ে দেখল তার মা মিসেস ফরিদা খানো মাথা খারাপের মতো ছোটাছুটি করছেন সমানে দু হাত ছুটছেন শূন্যে একটা কাক তার সেই দু হাত অনুসরণ করে উড়ে বেড়াচ্ছে একবার মনে হলো ঠোকর দিবে বা কাকটা ফরিদার মাথার খুব কাছে নেমে আসছে আবার হুস খেয়ে গজখানিক উপরে উঠে যাচ্ছে মায়ের এই মূর্তি দেখে বিউটি ভীষণ রকম চমকালো সমগ্র জীবনের অস্বাভাবিকত্ব চোখের সামনে নিয়ন সাইনের মতো জ্বলে উঠল কষ্ট হলো বিউটির ফরিদার জন্য কষ্ট হলো লাভলির জন্য আর নিজের জন্য অস্তিত্ব জানান না দিয়ে চুপচাপ 
নিচে নেমে এলো এত দুর্দার করে ওঠার পরও বিউটির উপস্থিতি ফরিদা টের পেলেন না তিনি তখন কায়মনো বাক্যে কাক তাড়াতে ব্যস্ত এক সময় কাকটা ক্লান্ত হয়ে পাশের বাড়ির ছাদে গিয়ে বসলো কিন্তু ডাক ডাকা থামালো না এমন হঠাৎ রণে ভঙ্গ দেয়ায় ফরিদ বোকার মতো দাঁড়িয়ে পড়লেন টের পেলেন ব্লাউজের ভিতরটা ভিজে চিপচিপা হয়ে গেছে ছাদের রেলিং ধরে কিছুক্ষণ জোরে জোরে নিঃশ্বাস নিলেন পাগল মানুষের মতো হাত উঁচু করে ওকে তাড়াবার চেষ্টা দ্য ওয়ে ইউ পোর্ট্রেট দ্যাট অ্যান্ড দ্য সেকেন্ড ডটার বিউটি ফাইন্স আ মাদার ইন দ্যাট কন্ডিশন অ ওমেন হুজ আদারওয়াইজ এক্সট্রিমলি সেলফ কন্ট্রোল্ড Uh, Nadia, you have translated that passage beautifully. Any thoughts on that? Well, it was one of the scenes that like, really, really drew me, um, particularly because of that. Um, this is like the one, one of the moments we see that Farida Khanum, she herself is realizing that she's losing it in some way. Um, but it was like the physical manifestation of everything unraveling. And, and I have a particular affinity for crows. <laughs> <laughs> so I really loved that scene um and I loved that you know the the cover the design of the book itself um in fact I have like my coffee mug which has a which has Edgar Allan Poe and a crow on it um it's supposed to be a raven but they um anyway it's a funny story yeah. but um that was one of the scenes that I really enjoyed um translating that's i guess i that's all i can tell you about that but um yeah it's one uh, of the if, i feel like it's one of the key scenes in the book it is but there are there are several of these very striking scenes and images and uh, lovely the daughter who suddenly given the freedom to leave the home first time ever these are women two sisters who've never been allowed to go to school never been allowed to have friend never go out and of course not to be married and then on her 40th birthday lovely is suddenly given this immense opportunity to walk out of the house alone and to wander around uh, dhaka with the excuse and the task perhaps of looking for some shalwar kameez in the market in the gosia market but many other things happened to her of course so uh, and, and as lovely wanders to these various spots in dhaka and particularly ramna park which is so well known uh, some misadventures take place and it's very difficult for any translator to handle this conversation between lovely the person who's alone uh, out in the open for the first time and the so called man in her head the speaking voice the inner voice that is constantly <laughs> debating with her mocking her challenging her doing all kinds of things and it's a male voice so as a translator how did you deal with this duality in lovely and particularly the ramna park episodes the ramna park episodes i think is the favorite part of my for me um in that book and that was one of the see, like that particular thing but the conversation between lovely and the man in her head and then um the red muffler guy we never find out his name but she has a, a crucial exchange with him um the thing that i had to be careful about in that in those scenes were trying to keep the registers different because how lovely thinks herself the tone of it is very different than when the man in the head speaks to her as you said he's mocking her he pushes her provokes her to do things um and i was very curious and i'd love to hear lisa talk about why she um again this is like something we have not discussed but i was very <laughs> curious why the man was a man and not a woman like why mm-hmm. her inner voice was not a woman's voice i found that fascinating um yeah so uh, it's just keeping the registers know. different sorry yeah it would have something to do with a repressed sexuality that's my sense in reading the book but would you like to read us some passages from that part of the novel sure um so at this point lovely in her meanderings and i feel like 
the fact that Lovely was let out on that particular day was, it was also an issue of Farida trying to control everything in her vicinity. And depending on her situation, her mental situation, it like she had to let go of one thing to keep hold of another, the birthday meal that she's preparing for Lovely, which has to be perfect. So when Lovely is finally let out, it's, um, she can't believe it. She even thinks like this is something that's worth going into the Guinness Book of Records. This, this has never happened before that she's been let out by herself without a chaperone. Um, so anyway, she, she, as you said, hits various spots in the city and she ends up in Romna Park and she's sitting on a bench and this guy who is referred to in the book as um, Red Muffler Guy, um, he approaches her and strikes up a conversation and then they're talking and out of the blue, he kind of says, do you want to go with me to my apartment? I live alone. So it's clearly a sexual proposition that's happening, um, which is, it's not very common in, in our culture at any rate. So it's a bit of a um, stunner for her and she doesn't know quite how to react. And she's debating whether she should or shouldn't. The man inside her head had been strangely silent, not a peep out of him. He was lying low. Who knew if he had been rattled by the abrupt turn of events, but now he perked up. Abu Munid, let's go to his place. It sounds like he will also be quite hospitable and welcoming. Lovely strongly opposed his suggestion. She shivered. No, no, Amma will kill me if she finds out. How will she ever know? Are you're going to have a showdown today anyway. You might as well go all the way. She began to answer the man inside her head, but then went quiet. Red Muffler Guy was staring at her with the hint of a smile on his lips. Barely half an hour ago, she had thought of this same young man as fearful and timid, someone still wet behind the ears. And now there was this devious expression playing on his face, a pose. It had all been a pose. She couldn't decide whether to answer the man inside her head or just go with the red muffler guy. It was true that she wanted to follow this young man somewhere, anywhere. Even if they couldn't go anywhere, they could at least walk along the lake shore ahead of them. What harm could that do? Don't worry about me, red muffler guy said. You two go ahead and finish your conversation. I'm in no hurry. I'm not talking to anyone. What's the name of the man inside your head? He has no name. No name? No name. You should give him a name. There's no one inside my head. Lovely's eyes teared up. She had no clue where the tears came from or why. She felt like Red Muffler Guy was mocking her with the same cruelty that drove children to chase a mad woman with taunts of freak, freak. Children didn't understand how cruel they could be. Did he understand? Okay, I'm going to go and pick up a couple of cigarettes. In the meantime, the two of you can decide whether you want to come with me or not. No pressure. You only come if it makes you happy. The young man stood up and Lovely immediately became certain that he wasn't coming back. She felt a desperate desire to say, yes, I'll go. I don't have to talk it over with anyone. I'll go. But inevitably, she didn't. When had her desires ever borne fruit? Red Muffler Guy vanished into the trees of Ramna Park with long strides. The man inside Lovely's head had been burning to talk for a while and couldn't hold himself back. You'll never get a chance like this, Apomuni. How long can you make do with just your fingers? Come on, let's go. What can go wrong? This isn't a guy who's likely to attack you or kill you. How do you know? I know, Apomuni, you're itching to go there. You've never known what love is. Now that you have this one chance, explore it with your heart, with your body. I've never known what love is. How could you say that? My heart still burns. Sorry, Apumuni, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, of course, you know, but physical love? You'll spend an entire lifetime and then die one day, but you'll never know what physical love is. What the hell is that? Just think that the creator himself has handed you this one chance. Toba, toba, shame. No, no, I could never do something like that. You've egged me on to do many shameful things. Amma, oh, screw your Amma. Who gives a shit about Amma here? I've egged you on to do many shameful things. Is that fair? Was I the one who brought you all that porn by Rashomai Gupto? All I said was, put your fingers to good use. 
But Apamani can buttermilk sake the thirst for cream. That's why I was saying, let's go. I always knew I shouldn't talk to you, that it would land me in trouble someday, big trouble. I'll stop there. Thank you. Lisa, you wanted to say something? Yes, I, I yes. was, I was, um, I want to say this, this voice actually uh, uh, came as a coping mechanism for lovely uh, to, to, to be sane in that house, household. And, uh, and lovely actually desires um, intimacy. She, she craves for love. And uh, from her perspective, um, uh, someone who she, uh, she can talk to, that imaginary person uh, feels only logical to be a man and who, uh, whom she can um, talk to, uh, you know, mundane stuff to whimsical. Um, so, and it, and it also, um, works as a coping mechanism for her. True, uh, coping in many ways, even yeah. with an um, hardly understood sexuality with relations, with romance, what had happened to her with her cousin. So uh, the, the women characters, beauty of course is another kind of a person. And although the sisters are in close proximity with one another and play games together, they also have all kinds of differences of opinion and behavior. And uh, whereas uh, Lovely is not a particularly good looking woman at all, she has two braids and she's, you know, her mother keeps uh, sort of pointing out to various things. Beauty is, according to her name and her behavior, just obsessed with skincare and beauty care and she does lentil packs and all that kind of thing. Um, so uh, the, the differential between the two sisters, the, how does that work out? Because Lovely is the retiring one, but she's the one who's allowed to go out. Beauty seems a more aggressive one and she has been made to stay at home and gets even more aggressive. And that's when she goes looking for her mother and gets to the rooftop. So uh, what is the relationship between the two sisters, Lisa? Relationship between the two sisters are very um, loving at the same time, very conflicting as well. Um, beauty, beauty loves her sister, but at the same time she has this a uh, very deep uh, rooted hatred. Uh, hatred is a very strong word, but I would like to use it here. Hatred uh, towards her because of the fact that she thinks, she feels that she is, you know, she thinks that she is more beautiful than her. She thinks she's more, um, you know, vibrant than her, more kind of, and she, she's not that boring like her sister, but, but still their cousin, uh, the only uh, male gaze that they uh, they uh, experienced in their lives um, didn't didn't want to have anything to do with her. Uh, that rejection, that you know, self imposed uh, imposed feeling of rejection, um, actually deeply hurt. Uh, you know, deeply uh, it 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 deeply hurts uh, beauty, and and she thinks and. And, and she puts the blame on her sister that, you know, because of her sister, I, I didn't get to experience this because of her sister. Um, um, I, I, she did, he did not even look at me. That, 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 um, that sense of um, rejection, uh, she, she felt and, and that she kind of blames uh, uh, Lovely for that. Mm. And when we see that uh, she actually tells her mother um, about their relationship, Ria's uh, you know, cousins and, um, and her sister's relationship, I don't know what, uh, whether I'm giving away too much. But... <laughs> don't give out the plot, we'll leave you with that. <laughs> and and uh, uh, Nadia, one of the most difficult uh, tasks for a translator is to deal with dialogue. And particularly with uh, the English equivalent for language spoken by people like domestic helpers who would not have any access to English. And of course, you cannot have a, a, a domestic family seen in an Indian home or a Bangladeshi home and many others in Asia without that domestic category. They have a very key role to play in this novel. Uh, Rabia's ma, that young boy. 
So when you were translating that kind of language from Bangla to English, what kind of challenges did you face and how did you resolve them? It was actually easier in this book than in, in others that I've worked on because, um, and this is something I've wondered about, um, urban speech is peppered with English. And depending on your level of education, depending on your class, um, the English use, usage varies. But in this book, we don't really see that. And I've wondered um, whether that was also a function of how this household in particular is very, very isolated. Um, for instance, there's that moment where um, we find out, oh, there's an actually, there's a cell phone in this house. And um, mm -hmm. this from Forida Khanum's you know, thinking surrounding the device, we realize that cell phones have been there for a while. It's just this household um, doesn't use it the way, or that even the the um, entry of a, of a regular telephone into the household was a big deal. Like she had not wanted a phone. She, had, she basically wants to cut off everyone from the outside world um, and herself possibly acting as a conduit towards that. So in terms of language, that was one thing that in didn't really come up for this book, interestingly. Um, their speech is not um, strewn with English phrases, um, and especially uh, when Rabia Zma speaks or when the, the boy speaks, um, I didn't really encounter anything. I did translate this book at least two, three years ago, so I might be missing something, Lisa. Uh, uh, I think that the the dialogue part uh, for uh, for the maids and for for that uh, for Pichi that uh, that serpent boy, um, when I I was writing it, it came from the source because we we uh, I mean the from from the way they talk uh, um, and we we are very I I'm very used to this this uh, um, this kind of this pattern of uh, talking um, and. And I, I wanted to keep that, but at the same time, when, uh, you know, that family, the, the, the two sisters and the mother, when they talk, it's, it's, um, it's not that, that a shift from, from them. Um, uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and that is also very practiced in, in uh, you know, in, in middle-class houses. It, it okay. depends on where you are from, which part of the city you, uh, you live in, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, that's why the, uh, you know, dialogue-wise, uh, there is a distinct uh, uh, difference between their, um, their, their way of talking. But but at the same time, there's a similarity, and mm. um, and I wanted to uh, I wanted to keep them um, to show that even though even there there are similarities in their expression in their dialogues, but they are miles apart in their status, and and they're miles apart in their uh, you know in their in their expression of uh, of, of uh, freedom or or rights. Uh, so it it is very uh, fascinating for me in that household how uh, how actually Pichi is the most uh, most uh, you know uh, most uh, free freer um, member of the, of this family. He, he goes out, he brings things, and he is like a window to uh, to love uh, beauty, um, and uh, and that is what I wanted to keep, uh, and 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 dialogue was also that similarities I wanted to keep to show that how their position uh, and status is is miles and miles apart. And that's true um, about you know that the speech is is not that apart like not that different like the gap isn't huge between um you know the employers and the um the domestic staff but in a lot of cases what happens is when the children go to school um there's a certain urbanization that happens speech patterns shift and in this hustle that never happens because these girls don't have any outside influences no. at all they don't they've been in prison most of their lives so that shift away from where um Farida Khanum comes from the village and um, Mukhlas Shaheb as well, they come from different parts of the country to Dhaka, which is, which is the case with many, many middle class families in Bangladesh. Like that's where the jobs are, that's where, you know, good schools are, so that's where, you know, people head towards. 
Um, so that that change never happens, that shift never happens for this family of, or for these children um, because they never go to school. The other thing I thought, I didn't actually think Pichi was the freest one there. I thought it was Rabe Asma because she had, Pichi, I mean, he's, he's a kid. He comes and goes and um, like a child, he's, 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 he's very cognizant about the different, uh, about the power structure in the household, but he's also in a way- he's very aware of it. it. He's very cognizant of it. Yes, He's absolutely. Very aware of it. Yeah. But with Rabe as my field, it was fascinating to see. There were moments where, for instance, once she thinks, when she's being berated by Furida Khanum, she thinks, well, you know, this woman, she treats her own daughter so badly compared to that, you know, I'm, I'm better off. And she is in a way, because she doesn't have that emotional engagement that the daughters have, obviously, with the mother. She is capable of seeing. Sorry? Yeah. Um... Sorry for cutting in, but you know, sort of we might run out of time. And I just wanted to ask both of you that the women characters seem much, much stronger than the men characters. You know, one almost forgets about the father their of their existence, yeah. Lovely, and uh, that cousin, Riaz. And there, I don't want to give away the story. And I think people who are listening to this program should go out and get the book. But the <laughs> male characters seem so much more timid, cowardly. Uh, she even calls her husband half dead. So uh, was there some kind of a thought of this uh, nature that went uh, into the creation of the male-female character difference? Yes, uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, when I was carrying these characters, uh, uh, it was it was a con it was a my my con conscious decision not to uh, show uh, any men as uh, representatives of the horrors of patriarchy. Um, there's there's uh, I wanted to do that because um, the patriarchy is so implanted in us that we don't need men to manifest it. Um, and we immediately recognize it even um, in the absence of men in a household. Mm -hmm. um, that is what I uh, wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to explore. And, it, and you can even you can find patriarchy at work even in families there there are there are no men um, so this is um, more often um, that that not um, how it works in societies uh, that is that is what I really wanted to show that even you don't need men to uh, project patriarchy mm -hmm. it is so ingrained it is so implanted in our uh, in our psyche in our um, mm -hmm. homes and in our society one last question and i'll put this to nadia as a translator uh, does the uh, ideological thinking of the writer as in this case that patriarchy can be shown through women you don't need men does that interfere with the way you as a translator deal with the text your own thinking on the subject, for instance? I wouldn't say it interferes with it because um, I think that that's like, that is something that we're both on the same page on. Mm -hmm. um, because patriarchy as a, it, it's a system. And um, I'm finding it a little bit difficult without describing the dynamic between uh, the characters. I don't want to give away um, the plot, but the fact that you brought up the men, they're almost like uh, the marginal characters in the story. Yeah, um, right. You don't really get to focus on, on what their side of it is really, um, for either's husband, for instance. It's not necessary to focus on them. And the no, absolutely not. It's not. Sure. But I thought it was fascinating that, um, one other thing that I really liked about it was that it's very evident that he is also a victim of patriarchy. Yes, of course. He has yes. a very, very unhappy life. He's, he's, he has a marginal existence in his own family, his own yes. household. Um, and the that's, other... That's a very important point. And uh, we have run out of time, so we'll have to end our discussion. It's a very rich, complex, and brilliantly written book. So congratulations to Lisa and congratulations, Nadia, for that wonderful translation. 
It's been great to be with you and to discuss the book. And I wish you the very best. And I hope all our listeners will go out and get a copy of the of Hellfire. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for making the time. This was this was really fun to do. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa, Shabnam, and Mala Shri for that beautiful session. We just didn't want it to end. If you've enjoyed this session, please do share with your friends and on your social media pages. Thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. We promise to be back next week again for another beautiful session of Words Abridges. Till then, good night.